Hello and welcome to Dialogue Firesides on October 25th, 2020 with Thomas B. Griffith on a Latter-day Saint approach to politics. I'm Taylor Petrie conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation Board. Other members, Michael Austin, Chris Kimball, and Rebecca DeSchweinitz are also part of our group today. We're using our webinar format on Zoom and running a live stream on Facebook. We're recording this program and we'll post the recording as soon as it's available. More than 50 years of dialogue content, articles, essays, poetry, and art is available online at dialoguejournal.com and also at JSTOR. These dialogue fireside sessions are posted on the Dialogue Journal YouTube channel and our podcast feed in your favorite podcast app and at dialoguejournal.com slash podcasts. If you're enjoying these sessions, please consider supporting Dialogue by subscription or donation. We will include the dialoguejournal.com address and a number you can text in the chat. We are excited to announce the new monthly Dialogue Fireside. For our inaugural Fireside, we welcome our distinguished speaker, Thomas B. Griffith, who will be teaching us about a Latter-day Saint approach to politics. Brother Griffith was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for DC for the D.C. Circuit in 2005 by President George W. Bush. Just last month, he stepped down from that court. His legal career before becoming a judge included service as the general counsel of BYU, the chief legal officer of the United States Senate, and a partner in a law firm in Washington, D.C. Tom is a native of Washington and graduated from BYU in humanities and comparative literature and earned a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. He is currently a lecturer in law at Harvard and the University of Virginia. Tom joined the church as a junior in high school in McLean, Virginia, served a full-time mission in Southern Africa, and has held a variety of teaching and leadership positions. Before embarking upon a legal career, he was employed by the church educational system and directed its programs in the Baltimore, Maryland region. Tom is a member of the advisory board of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship and was the founder, along with Terrell Gibbons, of the Temple and Observatory Group, which is committed to the view that developments in historiography should be welcomed, explored in frank and open discussion, and incorporated into Latter-day Saint self-understanding. For our viewers on Zoom, there is a chat function by which you can comment, ask questions, and propose answers. We ask that you be courteous and thoughtful about the chat. The chat room is recorded. We will also follow the chat and introduce questions and answers when appropriate. Tonight, our invocation will be offered by Charlie Mullins Glenn, who is a writer, a teacher, an activist, and an accidental activist. She's the founder of Mormon Women for Ethical Government and a founding member of the, the Everyone Belongs Project. She currently sits on the external advisory board for BYU's civic engagement program. Our benediction will be offered by Erica Munson, who is a teacher, a mother, and grandmother. For the past nine years, she's been involved in LDS LGBTQ inclusion work, first with Mormons Building Bridges, which she co-founded, and now is a board member of Emmaus LGBT Ministry. She is on the missionary committee of the Pinehurst Ward in the Sandy, Sandy Utah East Stake. We're also pleased to have Russell Hancock of the amazing St. Michael Trio provide our opening music. From Palo Alto, California, the birthplace of dialogue, Brother Hancock is, a great, is grateful for the legacy and continued promise of dialogue. And in that spirit is offering up the timeless music of Bach, his Sicilienne, which is from the third sonata for harpsichord and flute. What Russell is playing is his brother's transcription, which ingeniously collapses Bach's sonata into a single instrument.
Charlie, don't forget to unmute. Thank you. Our loving Father, we are grateful to be able to gather through the miracle of technology as a community of disciples of Jesus Christ to hear the words and the wisdom of thy son and our brother, Tom Griffith. We pray that thy spirit will be with him as he speaks to us and that our hearts and minds might be open as we listen, that our capacity for understanding and for inspiration might be increased. We pray for our troubled world and for those of our brothers or sisters who suffer, those who have had to flee their homes or who are in any other way oppressed or frightened or hungry or sick. We pray that they might be ministered to by angels, both heavenly and mortal, and that we might seek every opportunity to be those mortal ministers in doing whatever we can to alleviate suffering and pain and to bring greater light and goodness to the world. We pray, Father, that we may never forget that we are thy children and that every fellow passenger on this planet is a brother or sister. May we refuse to allow differences of opinion and perspective to divide us. We are deeply grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ, for his life, for his example, for his teachings, and above all, for his atoning sacrifice. And we say these things in his holy name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sister Glenn. I, I feel like with that prayer, we might be able to just stop. That was beautiful. Um, and uh, Brother Hancock, uh, thank you for that lovely rendition of Bach. And uh, Taylor, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, uh, tonight. I, I should say at the outset that uh, although my remarks will address the, uh, the American political environment, uh, I think the principles I urge have application to Latter-day Saints worldwide. So uh, if, if you are not uh, a citizen of the United States of America, uh, forgive me for sounding parochial. I don't, I don't intend to. <clears throat> I'm a native Washingtonian. Uh, my mother's family, the Bells, settled in nearby Montgomery County, Maryland in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, my father's family, the Griffiths, came to Washington DC in the 1830s and we've been here ever since. I grew up just across the Potomac River in McLean, Virginia. And I grew up with a deep interest in American politics. Uh, I remember watching President Kennedy uh, throw out the first pitch on opening day in 1962. And then I stood along Constitution Avenue with my family and watched his funeral cortege a year later. Uh, I lived a short distance from the home of Robert F. Kennedy, whose 11 children were everywhere in McLean. Uh, I went to school and played sports with the children of congressmen, senators, cabinet secretaries, presidential aides, and Supreme Court justices. And, and these were public schools. Uh, I worked on Capitol Hill during summers in, uh, in high school. And there was nothing unusual about my experience, everyone did that. I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a junior in high school in a ward that was filled with political figures. To me, there was nothing unusual about practicing politics while pursuing discipleship of Christ. I saw many in my ward who did just that. It wasn't until serving my mission in Southern Africa that I learned that there were some in the church who thought there might be a tension between the two. My mission president, who I adored, frequently told me that he thought my interest in politics odd for someone devoted to building the kingdom. Many years later, as general counsel of BYU, I discovered that my mission president's view was shared by some senior general authorities. On the one hand, there seemed to be a fascination with Washington, DC. Uh, given my background, I benefited from that interest. On the other hand, there was a wariness about DC, a, a distrust that's understandable given the way the federal government has interacted with the church in the past. Given my background, I was viewed by some with suspicion. Over the years, I've gained a greater appreciation for my mission president's concern and the suspicion of others. 
there are high spiritual risks that accompany the practice of politics in a fallen world. Tonight, I will speak about how to practice politics without losing our souls. N.T. Wright, the Anglican cleric, who is also one of the foremost New Testament scholars, wrote a book last decade titled Simply Christian, Why Christianity Makes Sense. This volume is Wright's effort to provide a defense of Christianity in the tradition of C.S. Lewis's masterpiece, Mere Christianity. Wright begins, as Lewis did, by arguing that evidence for the existence of God is found in the fact that almost all humans agree upon a common set of moral principles. The first principle upon which Wright relies for his argument there, there is a God is what he calls our passion for justice. That strikes me as an interesting place to begin. Is that where Latter-day Saints would start? How many of us think of a passion for justice as a religious impulse? My guess is that we think of religious imperatives differently. We are more likely to think of our religious life in terms of that from which we abstain. I wonder if we are missing something fundamental about the religious life. Are we missing the big picture by focusing on some comparatively insignificant corners of the canvas? I begin my remarks here because the thrust of my argument is that politics for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear is a religious activity. Properly understood, politics should be pursued to satisfy our passion for justice, which comes from God. But as I have already suggested, the practice of politics poses grave risk to our spiritual well-being. It's through politics that communities decide the rules that govern society because so much is at stake when rules are being made about security, liberty, and wealth, politics inevitably attracts many who are drawn to power. And the pursuit of power as an end in itself is sinful. The savior warned us about this. Remember what he told his disciples about the rich? Quote, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, lest you feel too comfortable by assuming the savior's dire warning is targeted better at those in the business world. <clears throat> it was C.S. Lewis's view that the riches referred to by the Lord cover more than wealth. He believed it really covers riches in every sense, good fortune, health, popularity, and all the things one wants to have. If I may be allowed to add my own gloss to Lewis, riches covers power too, civil and ecclesiastical. So be careful. The pursuit of politics poses real danger to our spiritual welfare. The answer, of course, is not to avoid politics. That is, in my view, an unacceptable response to those who have been called to be the salt of the earth, a powerful image that assumes we are deeply involved in a society larger than our family and ward. Although spirituality begins with allowing the effects of Christ's atoning sacrifice, and his awe-inspiring grace to heal the wounds that sin inflicts on our broken hearts, we learn from scripture, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and the temple endowment, that the highest form of spirituality is most powerfully expressed when we work to make the effects of the atonement radiate beyond ourselves and our families to create communities, our ward, our town, our nation, the world. I believe that the work of community building is the most important spiritual work to which we are called. All other work is preparatory. But how do we engage in politics and build community without losing our souls? That is where Wright's insight may be helpful. 
our involvement in politics must be an expression of our God-given passion for justice. Remember Jacob's teachings in the Book of Mormon from Jacob chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches if ye seek them. And ye will seek them for the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to liberate the captive and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. According to Jacob, God will only aid those who pursue riches for the intent to do good, recognizing no doubt that what it means to do good is so vague that the qualification hardly places any limits on our motives, Jacob makes clear what he means. And the force of his teaching is a slap in the face to those of us who are comfortably secure in the prosperity of the North American middle class in the 21st century. God will only aid those who pursue riches to do good for very particular purposes, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, liberate the captive, administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. As Jesus would later do, Jacob is teaching us that we must expend our best efforts to provide help and succor to those who have been pushed to the margins of our society, to those who have been left out and left behind. Remember that Jesus taught that it was those considered the least in the eyes of the world who were in truth his brethren. Over 40 years ago, Robert F. Kennedy expressed a secular vision of this idea during his visit to a South Africa that was in the grips of racial segregation. Although some of the examples Kennedy used in this speech that I'll quote at the University of Cape Town are dated, his call to pursue a passion for justice is timeless from Senator Kennedy. There is discrimination in New York racial inequality of apartheid in South Africa, serfdom in the mountains of Peru. People starve to death in the streets of India. A former prime minister is summarily executed in Congo. Intellectuals go to jail in Russia and thousands are slaughtered in Indonesia. Wealth is lavished on armaments everywhere. These are different evils, but they are the common works of man. They reflect the imperfections of human justice, the inadequacy of human compassion, the defectiveness of our sensibility towards the sufferings of our fellows. They mark the limit of our ability to use knowledge for the well being of our fellow humans throughout the world. And therefore, they call upon common qualities of conscience and indignation, a shared determination to wipe away the unnecessary sufferings of our fellow humans at home and around the world. More recently, Mitch Daniels, a conservative, has reminded us that this impulse is not partisan. Says Daniels, our first thought, our first thought is always for those on life's first rung and how we might increase their chances of climbing. Uh, I, I'm arguing today in favor of a Latter-day Saint approach to politics. Let me make clear, however, that I'm not saying you will have certain views about marginal tax rates or the best way for a nation to conduct its foreign affairs by virtue of the fact that you are a Latter-day Saint. In fact, I'm quite uncomfortable with those who maintain that the principles of the restored gospel not only inform, but somehow compel their partisan uh, aff affiliations. I've noticed uh, that some of the political de debate in our Latter-day Saint community has lost sight uh, of, of this. I, I wanna distance myself from the, the foolish idea that to be a Latter-day Saint in the United States today requires or even tends toward a particular partisan affiliation. You'll, you'll recall the words of the Oxford Don to his young charges as they began their studies. Nothing you learn here at Oxford will be of the slightest possible use to you later, save only this that if you work hard and intelligently, you should be able to detect when a man is talking rot. And that is the main, if not the sole purpose of education. Years ago, I read this uh, 
quote at a BYU forum assembly at BYU and said, if your education at BYU hasn't helped you see that such partisan talk is rot, then you failed in your studies. And I'm not kidding. Now, disagreement's critical to the well-being of our nation, but we have to carry on our arguments with the realization that those with whom we disagree are not our enemies, rather they are our colleagues in a great enterprise. When we respect each other enough to respond carefully to argument, we are filling necessary roles in the Republic. What I am urging is that there should be a Latter-day Saint way of engaging in politics. And like every other activity in which Latter-day Saints participate, our involvement in politics should be a result of what we understand from the restoration of the gospel about the atonement of Christ. We know from the story of Adam and Eve that Satan's objective in the Garden of Eden was to divide men from women. A casual glance at the history of the world reveals that Satan's chief tactic is to divide people one from another. The fault lines he uses are gender, wealth, race, religion, culture, and the list goes on. Wherever we see division and animosity, we see the work of Satan. By contrast, the most fundamental work of Christ is to bring people together. His atonement, his atonement has a vertical component to be sure, Christ will unite us with God, but his atonement has a horizontal component that is just as important. Christ will unite us with other humans. Joseph Smith called this the sealing power, and he made clear that that the great he, he made clear that the great objective of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ was to seal together all mankind. Now, I have two ideas about how Latter-day Saints can make the atonement of Christ part of the way we practice politics. First, we must keep firmly fixed in our minds that the Lord's primary vehicle to bring about reconciliation in a fallen world is the restored church and not any particular nation, party, movement, or leader. Our best efforts should be directed at building the kingdom of God on earth by being fully engaged in church work. We already know the importance of devotional activities, but we must always keep in mind that our ministering assignments and the other duties that come from our membership in the church are far more important than our political work. Moments before he was executed, Thomas More, the patron saint of lawyers and politicians, uttered these words, which provide the right view of our priorities. I die the king's good servant, More said, but God's first. This idea is captured in the British anthem, I vow to thee, my country. I'll spare you the pain of listening to me sing this majestic hymn. But notice as I read the dueling allegiances described in the two verses. In my view, it gives the proper perspective on our loyalties to God and country. The first verse, I vow to thee, my country, all earthly things above, entire and whole and perfect, the service of my love, the love that asks no question, the love that stands the test, the love that lays upon the altar, the dearest and the best, the love that never falters, the love that pays the price, the love that makes undaunted the final sacrifice. Now compare that with the second verse. And there's another country I've heard of long ago, most dear to them that love her, most great to them that know, We may not count her armies. We may not see her king. Her fortress is a faithful heart. Her pride is suffering. And soul by soul and silently, her shining bounds increase. And her ways are ways of gentleness. And all her paths are peace. Second, we must treat our political opponents in a fashion that reflects our understanding that they, like we, are children of God for whom the Savior suffered, bled, died, and lives today. This may be the point at which the call to practice a Latter-day Saint approach to politics presents the greatest challenge. It seems that as part of our headlong rush to be embraced by American society, we cheer when any member of our number 
achieves, achieves some measure of success in politics with little regard to how that success is achieved. 40 years ago, Robert Bella, the renowned sociologist and scholar of religious life in America, sounded a warning while visiting BYU that we would do well to consider today. Said Bella, perhaps the Mormon experience, which was in its initial phase a protest against the world of harsh capitalist individualism, but then through much of the 20th century became an increasingly close adaptation to that world, which was really originally rejected. Perhaps that experience could give food for thought, not only for Mormons, but for all of us who live in this nation. Mormons often criticize the larger society in which they live and contrast it to their own vigorous community. How many of them realize that their own current social, economic, and political views and actions may contribute to the wasteland that they see around them, or that their own experience as a people might suggest a very different course for America today, end of quote. We seem to have a tacit understanding that it's permissible for us new kids on the block to play by the age old rules of politics, rules as old as civilization itself. We embrace tactics of personal attack and resort to plays upon passions and biases rather than treat our opponents with respect. C.S. Lewis avoided politics, but an insight from his essay, The Weight of Glory, offers a sobering perspective that serves as an indictment of the way the world does politics. Lewis wrote, it's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you'd be strongly tempted to worship. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. As far as I can tell, Lewis's challenge has gone untested in politics. Why can't Latter-day Saints, knowing what we do about the worth of each soul and the price that was paid by God for each person, be the ones to take up that challenge? A story from Slate Magazine many years ago gives an inkling of what such an approach to politics might mean. It relies upon a passage from a 1997 New York Times Magazine profile of John McCain. It takes a few minutes for me to read, but I think it'll be worth the effort. I also offer this story because it involves the legendary Mo Udall, who was my neighbor in McLean when I was a teen and was my first boss and mentor. Here's from the New York Times profile. When McCain was elected to the House of Representatives in 1982, he was, in his own words, a freshman right-wing Nazi. But his visceral hostility towards Democrats generally was quickly tempered by his tendency to see people as individuals and judge them that way. He was taken in hand by Morris Udall, the Arizona Congressman who was the liberal conscience of the Congress and a leading voice for reform. Mo reached out to me in 50 different ways, McCain recalled. Right from the start, he'd say, I'm gonna hold a press conference out in Phoenix. Why don't you join me? All these journalists would show up to hear what Mo had to say. In the middle of it all, Mo would point to me and say, I'd like to hear John's views. Well, I didn't have any views, but I got up and learned and was introduced to the state. There's no way Mo could have been more wonderful, McCain says, and there was no reason for him to be that way. For the past few years, Udall has lain ill with Parkinson's disease in a veterans hospital in Northeast Washington. Every few weeks, McCain drives over to pay his respects. These days, the trip is a ceremony, like going to church, only less pleasant. Udall is seldom conscious, and even then he shows no signs of recognition. 
McCain brings with him a stack of newspaper clips on Udall's favorite subjects, local politics in Arizona, environmental legislation, Native American land disputes, subjects in which McCain initially had no particular interest himself. In his time, which was not that long ago, Udall was one of the most sought after men of the Democratic Party. Yet, as he dies in a veterans hospital a few miles from the Capitol, only a handful of lawmakers come to see him. McCain spoke of how it affected him when Udall took him in hand. It was a simple act of affection and admiration. And for that reason, it meant all the more to McCain. It was one man saying to another, we disagree in politics, but not in life. It was one man saying to another, party political differences cut only so deep. Having made that step, they found much to agree upon in many useful ways to work together. This is the reason McCain keeps coming to see Udall, even after Udall has, last, has lost his last shred of political influence. The politics were never all that important. So as we embrace the best that American political culture offers, a commitment to freedom and equality of opportunity that is unique in all the world, I hope that we will not adopt the brand of politics that has far too often been part of that culture. I hope that we will be able to do politics differently than it has been done since the days of King Benjamin when he showed us a better path. That's an ambitious proposal, I know. Our discipleship must extend beyond our personal family lives and our activity in the church. It must move us to be involved in politics, but it should move us to serve in a way consistent with what we know and cherish about the Lord Jesus Christ and the redeeming power of his atonement. The gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke record an extraordinary exchange between Jesus and his disciples. Matthew puts the story on the eve of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Mark has it earlier in Capernaum. Luke includes it in his telling of the Last Supper. I will use Matthew's recounting. The mother of James and John had knelt before Jesus to ask a favor of him. She hoped that her sons would be able to sit at Christ's side when he rules the earth. The mere asking of the question with its presumption that James and John <clears throat> might be first among equals, angered the other apostles. Matthew writes, when the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not so be among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man came, not to be served, but to serve. And so as we engage in the challenging and vexing work of citizenship, and especially as we debate fundamental principles of how best to carry out the unique calling that is America's, keep in mind the counsel, nay, the plea of our greatest president, delivered at the most perilous time in our nation's history. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they, they will be by the better angels of our nature. What then of our current moment? How strong are our bonds of affection? The Constitution's form of government not only allows spirited disagreement, it requires it, but the Constitution cannot withstand a citizenry whose debates are filled with contempt one for another. As Michael Gerson observes, the heroes of America are heroes of unity. Our political system is designed for vigorous disagreement. It is not designed for irreconcilable contempt. A footnote from the Constitutional Convention in 1787 provides insight here. In July, 
the convention was on the brink of failure. The differences among the states were just too large. Yet six weeks later in September, they had succeeded. They had produced a constitution. In the letter to Congress that conveyed the work of the convention, George Washington wrote that the constitution was the result of quote, the spirit of amity and of that mutual deference which the peculiarity of our political situation rendered indispensable. Now, there is much that went into creating that spirit of vanity and mutual deference. Uh, others have noted how small group dynamics were at play and worked themselves out in close living quarters, dinner groups, and timely parties at the home of Benjamin Franklin where great food and spirituous drink facilitated, facilitated friendships among rivals. As George Mason wrote to his son, all of this socializing allowed almost perfect strangers from various states, quote, to grow into some acquaintance with each other, to form a proper correspondence of sentiments, close quote. But something more was at work than the power of small group dynamics among people who had become friends. Remember that the issue upon which the convention almost collapsed was whether the representation of states in Congress should be on an equal basis or proportional to their populations. Faced with this potentially fatal stalemate, the delegates made the critical decision that failure to create a constitution then and there was not an option. And here, I believe, is the most fundamental insight from their work. They determined that they would compromise on this central controversy, even though they could not be certain in advance what the terms of the compromise would be. I believe that the most fundamental impulse that created the constitution in the summer of 1787 was this yearning for union. The preamble announces that the purpose of the constitution is to form a more perfect union. In other words, the constitution assumes the coming together of a people who want to create a community and not just in their neighborhoods, villages, towns, counties or states, but on a continent and not just people with people of their own background, class, or viewpoint. The Constitution creates a structure of governance that can allow for human flourishing, but without this desire to unite, the Constitution cannot create a national community in which that flourishing will occur. Without this desire to unite, the Constitution is form without substance. When politicians and judges like me take an oath to uphold the Constitution, we commit to work for unity. We make a solemn pledge that we will not be agents of division. This vow to work for national unity is more than gauzy sentimentality or merely a call for civility in our public discourse. Instead, it is a studied and determined choice to work at union. And as we learn from the example of the delegates at the Philadelphia Convention, that requires compromise. The Constitution was created in the first instance by delegates who determined that they would compromise some of their dearly held views for the sake of union. More than that, and quite remarkably, these delegates determined that they would strike a compromise even before they knew what the terms of the compromise would be. In short, and to the point, they valued national unity over their own particular views. Is that the key to the way forward during this time of division? We will disagree over the content of the values to which we are committed as a nation. What is equality? What is liberty? But we must, in the words of the Declaration of Independence, mutually pledge to stay together as we debate their meaning. We must carry out our arguments in the spirit of amity and mutual deference. Perhaps most important of all, we must compromise so that we can accommodate others for the sake of union. Without that commitment, our constitution will fail. I'm sorry to say that I am not optimistic that we will overcome the tribal politics that beset us. Never before has a people been willing to put aside emblems of its tribal identities 
to create a nation in pursuit of a common good. The task is daunting. Christian scripture speaks of a time when every nation, kindred, tongue, and people will be united. But that is in a vision of a distant future under very different and extraordinary circumstances. Perhaps what we are trying to accomplish simply is not possible absent those circumstances. As Jonathan Haidt observes, the human mind is prepared for tribalism. A multicultural democracy is not a natural condition for us. At best, it is a fragile possibility. Fragile, yes, very fragile. And our political leaders, the stewards of our constitution and its norms, our pundits and our citizenry must keep that in mind always. When he launched his candidacy for the presidency in 1968, Robert F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy declared, I want the United States to stand for the reconciliation of men. In his translation of the New Testament, William Tyndall used the word reconciliation to translate the Greek word katalos, which means a change from enmity to friendship. But sometimes Tyndall used a newly created word to express the concept, atonement or at one minute. Times of change like our own are marked by turmoil and anxiety, making it tempting to seek shelter by lashing out in anger and frustration and then retreating to our own tribe of like-minded folk. But I don't think that's what the Lord calls us to do in the restoration. I believe instead that he wants us to join with others and become agents of reconciliation in a divided world. Elder Holland has reminded us that our best tools for addressing the divisions that beset us are the simple and profound teachings of Jesus summarized in the two great commandments, says Elder Holland. Someday I hope a great global chorus will harmonize across all racial and ethnic lines, declaring that guns, slurs, and vitriol are not the way to deal with human conflict. The declarations of heaven cry out to us that the only way complex societal issues can ever be satisfactorily resolved is by loving God and keeping his commandments, thus opening the door to the one lasting salvific way to love each other as neighbors. If we are trusted and skilled in creating and strengthening the bonds of affection that are a necessary precondition for constitutional government, this may be our greatest gift to a divided nation in this present moment of peril. That we may do so is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, have a, a period here of some questions and discussion if there is any from our, uh, from our attendees here. Uh, if you want to just take a moment to uh, type in your commentary, uh, we're seeing some you know, minor questions around citations of a particular things. We can maybe get to some of those later, but if there are some substantive issues that you'd love to, to kind of uh, uh, get out there, uh, go ahead and, and do that. We'll be monitoring the chat. We'll give you a moment to, uh, to do so. So maybe I'll start out and ask um, you to maybe talk a little bit about, you mentioned uh, King Benjamin lays out a better path. Uh, and maybe you could articulate some of that better path for us and get us yep. to think about what that might look like in our contemporary society. Sure. And, I, and on this, I'm borrowing from Jack Welch, uh, who has some fabulous insights about the role of King Benjamin uh, in, in the Book of Mormon. And you start with the, the idea that this is where Mormon begins his record, right? He's done the small plates. He's done Nephi. Uh, and that, but now this is his own editorial process at work. And he starts the story with this king of a city that is divided along ethnic lines, along economic lines, along educational lines. And Jack's close reading of, uh, of the book of Mosiah suggests that, that Benjamin had spent his life uh, at educational reform at, uh, at, at judicial reform, at penal reform, 
tried everything to unite his people and it didn't work, right? And so uh, uh, his last gasp effort is what we now have as King Benjamin's address. And it succeeded for a season, right? It succeeded for a season. Um, what do we learn from that from King Benjamin? I think we learned from that, uh, it, it, the first point I was trying to make, that, uh, that the reconciliation that needs to take place in the world it is primarily going to be a spiritual effort. It doesn't mean we disregard the political. No, no, we, we absolutely have to pay attention to that. But that's not going to be uh, where the greatest success is, is going to come. It, it's going to come from uh, teaching the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. I, uh, I think, you know, presumptuous of me to, to say what Mormon has in mind, but it, it is pretty interesting that he begins his account uh, and, and, and he tells us throughout that he's seen our day and of all the stories he could begin with. He starts with a, a story of a, a man who's trying to bring reconciliation to a, a divided people. So. Got a couple of questions here that I think um, uh, are sort of interested in, in seeing where you might draw certain limits in, in this. And so I'll, I'll paraphrase them here. If you're in a battle between good and evil, God doesn't tolerate reconciliation with evil, for instance. Uh, and uh, how do we balance the need to be civil and collaborative while also holding firm to crucial principles that we believe are tethered to humanity? Uh, so I wonder if you might, if you might speak so, to yeah, some that's, of those. Yeah, that's the Nazi white supremacist question, right? Mm -hmm. how, how are you civil uh, with, a, with, with, with someone who's... Uh, who's completely outside the, the bounds of what our society's uh, committed to, right? So I start with the notion that, I mean, we're not a blood and soil nation, right? There, there are ideas that, uh, that are critical, uh, and that now I really will be parochial. Now I am just talking about the United States. I mean, there are ideas that are central uh, to, to, being, uh, uh, to being an American, to being a United States citizen. And, and, and those ideas are a commitment to liberty and to equality. Uh, if someone is not part of that, um, they're outside the bounds of the, the debate that we want to have. Now, having said that, there's still no excuse for lack of civility, right? And I don't think there's any excuse to hold them in contempt, right? I mean, we fall back on the Savior's teachings of love your neighbor. And, uh, uh, and so, so contempt just can't be part of our uh, conversation. So I asked Mike, Michael Austin about this the, the, the other day. So how, how do you answer this? How do you answer this? Uh, I, you know, I had my own answers for this and I wanted to hear his and, and he's written about this in, in very persuasive, persuasively. And Michael points out there's a prudential point here, right? Uh, if you want to persuade someone, right? If you want to persuade someone, contempt is just not going to do it. So, so even there with the white supremacists and the Nazis, I, no, um, um, uh, you, you, you argue, you persuade, uh, but you do it civilly. Now, having said that, I'm not a pacifist. Uh, there are times, uh, I believe, uh, sorry, uh, Patrick, if you're out there, sorry. Pa Patrick can come and give you the other side of this argument, but I'm not a pacifist. So, so, so there is evil uh, that, that, that uh, uh, as the last resort, sometimes needs to be, uh, I think, fought uh, physically. But that's not what I'm talking about right now. You know what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the present moment we're in right now and, and, and the debates between Republicans and Democrats. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the real world that most of us, most of us, most of us live in. And I guess the point I'm making is we need to tone it down and stop copying um, uh, the way the world goes about doing this. So that, that's, that's the real thrust of what I'm trying to say. I see somebody just referenced Arthur Brooks, Arthur Brooks book, Love Your Enemy. Yep, I'm plagiarizing all over the place without any credit to him. I'm a big fan of Arthur Brooks and David Brooks. So there are there are a number a number of really great questions. Some are kind of on that earlier theme. Let me ask one that's a little bit different here. I've tried to be more aware of how things that resonate with me would sound to Black and Indigenous people of color populations, 
And I wonder if some of the conflict with dealing with our past is that we haven't been able to talk with nuance about our founding fathers. I've noticed my own tendency to say, well, that's, that was sad, but avoid really looking at and walking through what happened because it challenges ideals that, I so desperately, uh, that I'm so desperate for, especially now. How do we acknowledge the wrongs done and the degree to which this country was built on the backs of the oppressed while recognizing the truth of the ideals, presumably of the, of the founding fathers? Well, we just do that, right? We don't, we don't candy coat what they were, what they were like, and the mistakes they made, um, but but we recognize, I think, that by and large, I mean, not all, you know, some of them were really bad guys, right? But 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 they 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 stumbled upon an I, some ideas, right? And um, and so I think we need to teach both. I, I think we need to teach what the ideals were, and then we need to teach where they fell short of those ideals, so that we can do we can do better, right? But I agree, it, it does no one any good to have an idealized version of, of the framers because um, uh, first of all, that's not true. <laughs> uh, and, and, and second, it, it, it stymies us in our effort to reach the ideal, right? So I, um, I don't have any problem with that. I think, I think that's necessary. Now, now I gotta say, I, 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 I am committed to the ideals, uh, I think the the, the, the ideals that they identify for us are ideals that I embrace and I'm willing to try and build a nation around. Um, so I'm not willing to, to, to throw the project out uh, in view of, of their weaknesses and, 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 and shortcomings. Um, so I'll just ask a, a minor follow-up to this, and I think you might be able to, to, to um, maybe correct it if the, if the historical part isn't right. The compromise that you mentioned, which allowed for us to form the United States, surrounded the allowance of slavery. Uh, so I yeah. think this kind of goes right to the the, the problem is that the compromise uh, had a, some pretty big downsides potentially there too. Yeah. yeah. So I'm with Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. I mean, you can be with William Lloyd Garrison. I'm a big admirer of William Lloyd Garrison. I think his statue ought to be prominently placed in around places. It is in, in New England, but you got to make a choice. So Garrison thought it was a pact with the devil and should be torn down and started over again. And you know that, I mean, reasonable people can think that. I, I'm not there. I, I'm, with, I'm with Lincoln and Frederick Douglass who thought that, that you've got a kernel of an idea here, right? You've got a kernel of an idea. Uh, and, and so let's go with it. Let's go with it. Um, there's no question, it's beyond dispute that slavery was the original sin of, of, of the Republic. We're living with its consequences tragically uh, uh, today. But I think Lincoln and Douglas would say, uh, you had to get a constitution and a country. You had to get the project started. Now, they wish that it had not taken as long as it has to get as far as we have, and we have so much further to go, right? Um, but as a, as a I guess I'm not a judge anymore, but I, I took an oath to uphold the constitution and I still want to uphold the constitution. And as I understand it, that means you stick with this project and, and, and you try and help the country realize the ideals set forth uh, in, in that project. So maybe I'll um, kind of jump in on a similar theme uh, and push back in, a, in another way uh, from comments that I see from some other folks. Um, so you talk about um, kind of the, a passion for justice uh, should be at the forefront of what our religious impulse is, right? And that reconciliation, um, recognizing uh, that no people are ordinary is at the center of Christ's uh, gospel. Uh, and then we have kind of within the, within the restoration, um, kind of this remarkable, um, you know, moment of possibility for a multiracial church, uh, an inclusive church, and then that gets shut down a little bit. And so there's some uh, question about maybe the first reconciliation needed comes within the church. If we're going to be kind of this model for bringing reconciliation to the larger world, is that necessary within our own you know, yes. faith tradition um, 
first in order to kind of move move that along. Yeah, amen. Amen. And so and so let me crib from N.T. Wright, uh, uh, a lecture that he gave recently that I like a lot. He points he, he goes to John chapter 17, uh, the Savior's uh, a prayer after the, the Last Supper. And I, I, I want to say it's like verses 20 through 25, somewhere around in there. We, we know these verses because we use them in our proselytizing to talk about uh, the nature of the Godhead, that, that, that we have Christ praying to the Father in that prayer. The Savior is praying for his disciples, right? And he's praying that his disciples will be unified. We, we all know that. What Wright points out is the purpose for that prayer of unity in Jesus' own world words is so that the world will know that the Father sent Christ. In other words, my paraphrase, the, the most powerful way for the church to bear witness of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ is for the church to model reconciliation and unity at every level and throughout. And so if, if anyone on the missionary committees out there, maybe not, uh, but if they're out there, here, here's the message. Here's the new door approach, okay? The new door approach is I'm Elder Griffith. I'd like you to come uh, to attend our church in, in, in Hamilton. We're starting a church here that we'd like you to join. And let me tell you about our church. We are committed to reconciliation between the races, between the nations, between men and women. And, and we have a leader of our church who's telling us we need to lead out in rooting out racism. And we're trying to do that in our congregation. There you go. There, there's, the, the, if, there's the missionary message according to uh, John 17. And I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. I, I can think of no more powerful witness we can offer of the divinity of Christ than to show in the church that very unity. And that's hard work because we're way behind. We're way behind, right? We, we, we're, we're a long way behind, but, but we've got a call, right? I mean, President Nelson's been really clear about this. Lead out, lead out. That's, that's, that's the challenge in front of us now. It's an exciting challenge, exciting challenge. So uh, let me ask a, a version of, uh, of this question that kind of builds on your response that you just gave. Uh, the church has intervened in the political sphere in a number, uh, a number of times historically, uh, not always in ways that, uh, that might be interpreted as unifying. Um, how, do you, how, do, how do we deal with our own history there? And, uh, and, and what advice would you have about, uh, about thinking about what the institutional church's responsibilities are for the, the past and for the future? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, I, you know, um, that's out of my pay grade. I, uh, <laughs> that's, beyond, that's beyond tonight's topic. I just declared it so, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, okay, well, no, I'll, 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 I'll take a stab at it. No, I, you know, I, I did, you know, the church leaderships reserves the right to, in, to get involved in uh, matters where the church leadership thinks there's a, a moral uh, issue at stake. And, uh, I, you know, I'm all for uh, uh, churches being able to play in the public square, whether it's uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, Archdiocese of, Philadelphia, Archdiocese of Philadelphia uh, getting involved in pro-life activities. I, I think the public square uh, is, is a good place for churches to, to be. Now, that sounds like a dodge of the question you're asking what I think our church should do. Um, and I just think it's, sh I think it should be very careful, right? Very, 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 very careful. So. Well, you kind of answered that with your talk, right? So um, yeah. is our, are we centered on a passion for justice? Yeah. Now, let, let, me, let me, I probably, just, just so I'm not misunderstood. Um, I, that is the, I think the debate in amongst members of the church should be over, it, it's the Mitch Daniels quote, our first thought. Remember, this is a conservative Republican, right? Governor of Indiana, head of the Office of Management and Budget during Bush 43. A lot of people wanted to be president. This, this, is, this is a conservative, at least a pre-2016 conservative, right? This is, this, is, this is a movement conservative. And Mitch Daniels is saying, our first thought always is for those on the first rung of life's ladder and how we may help them climb. To me, that's what the debate should be over. 
what's the best way to make that happen? And, and, and you're going to have different approaches. You're going to have you're going to have progressives who are in favor of, you know, more state action. You're going to have conservatives who want to view it in a different way. And to me, that's, that's, that's fair game. That's fair game. You can have different views about how to do it. What's undeniable, I think, is that that's what the debate should be about, right? That's what we're supposed to be involved in in our society. Passion for justice, care for the poor. Um, that's not a partisan issue. Um, I am okay. seeing this great uh, question. Uh, how do you feel about dissent as a means of moving forward? So, uh, yeah. Dissent? RBG and members with, with deep questions. How do I feel about dissent? Okay, yeah. Well, in, in the public sphere, there better be dissent, right? I mean, that's the, our, our system is built for vigorous disagreement. Uh, reason discourse, right? Vigorous disagreement. So I, well, for that, does that answer the question or? Yeah, no, no. You got to have that, right? You got to have that. Let me ask a, a kind of an amalgamation of a couple of different questions. Um, part of the, the, um, nostalgia that you look back on in your own childhood and, and, and the John McCain, uh, uh story and so on kind of draw on an earlier period in American politics where partisanship seemed to be less intense. Um, and uh, depending on who you ask, it seems that one side has, um, has uh, been asymmetrical in its polarization relative to the other. And again, acknowledging that different parties would have different understanding of who has become more radical or who has become less cooperative or less likely, what the incentives are that have, that have changed uh, American politics to be more polarized. Um, is there a, a way in which uh, we can return to that earlier era or have the fundamental features of the politics uh, of the political moment that we live in now uh, change because the conditions on the ground have changed? Yeah, and that I don't know. That's why I end with I'm 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 kind of pessimistic about that. I mean, we're, this is a very different country than it's than it's ever been, right? And um, uh, and 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 I recognize that conservatives, many conservatives, will say, yeah, there 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 wasn't uh, uh, wasn't a, a lot of uh, disharmony before because you know the liberals were in control and they had super majorities, and uh, so I recognize people will say that. Um, but we're, we're fundamentally different uh, than, than we've ever been. And that, that, that's understandable, right? Demographics change, people's change. I think the real test is uh, we're, we're committed to liberty and equality. Can you pull that off in a multicultural democracy? I'm committed to trying to do it. And, and I, you know, I hope we can. Uh, I'm convinced that we cannot do it if we allow contempt, this culture of contempt, to, 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 to course through our veins. And in that, there's some pretty easy culprits, right? It's not hard to figure that out. Uh, if, if, if you're consuming most of your information from cable sources, you're being played, right? It's, it's just, again, it's the, you know, Arthur Brooks calls it the outrage industrial complex. There's not breaking news every 10 minutes. It's, that just doesn't happen. But there is on cable because that's how they drive uh, advertising revenues up. It's, it's all, a, it's a game, it's a game. And so if you're getting most of your uh, information from cable, recognize that the outrage that you're feeling, they're trying to do that, right? And, and that you're being, you're being played. And so, so stop it, <laughs> don't, read, uh, go, go to the, you know, go to the sources that, that will give you, it, 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 I, I recognize there's nothing unbiased so you read from a lot of different sources, but you read from places that uh, traditionally um, uh, have, have been known to uh, be better sources of information than others. But really, that, that's one evil right there is, is getting your news from, uh, from cable. Uh, and, and social media, the same, the, same, the, same, the same problem. You gotta fight back against this. Um, so. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, Rebecca or any of our other panelists, is there one final question that we want to, uh, that we want to get to or highlight here? I guess maybe I would ask, um, you know, what do you see the gospel, um, you know, really teaching us about creative, creating community? Um, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, let me borrow from, from Richard Bushman, right? Uh, I, I heard Richard once say that he thought that, uh, that our gift to the world as Latter-day Saints could be creating community. We know how to do this, right? We have a history of doing it and we do it every Sunday in our wards. And now I'm gonna draw back on Gene England, right? Why the church is as true as the gospel, or as I refer to it, Doctrine and Covenants section 139. I mean, it's, it, it, that, that essay to me is canonical. And, 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 and we're all familiar with it. Um, uh, the idea that, uh, that we create community in our ward with people who we may not ever wanna go to lunch with, but because of the nature of the ward, we're working with them in the primary. And we find out over time that, 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 that the Lord loves them as much as he loves us. And we build these, these relationships with people who uh, are different from us. Now, that's hard enough to do an award, but we're pretty good at it. The key is, the radiant Mormonism piece is, can we take the lessons that we learn from, from, from the tough times in a ward, getting along with people who we don't necessarily like and then learn to love. Can we take those skills and take them outside the foyer, take them outside the church, take them into our community? Uh, to me, that's, that's a great missionary opportunity, if you want to put it that way. That's what we're, I think that's what we're called to do. And, and, and when I'm optimistic about things, it's, it's, it's seeing us occupy that role, seeing us not be agents of division, but be agents of, of, of reconciliation. Uh, so what I'm really calling for is to, to reduce the loyalty to party. Just to, you know, James Matt, you know, in, in Federalist, they talk about faction and the evils of that. You have to have parties under our system. I, I get it. But man, that should not be our primary or even our secondary loyalty. There's got to be something much better than that. So, so no, no, let me finish on this note, okay? I'm way over time, I recognize. So in our, in our community, uh, we have a tradition uh, 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 that we have some special stewardship with respect to the Constitution, right? That the Constitution will be threatened someday and, you know, the imagery of hanging by a thread and that we'll have some role in, uh, in preserving it. Um, um, typically, I've heard that discussed in terms, uh, typically it comes from the right, right? And I've heard it discussed in in, in, in terms of, you know, learning the provisions of the Constitution and understanding how they work together in their history and all that. And I'm all for that. I'm all for studying the Constitution. But I really think that there's something more fundamental that we can do to preserve the Constitution. And that's to provide this sense of civic charity, right? Because without this civic charity, with, without these bonds of affection, the Constitution cannot succeed. It will fail. We may be seeing that happening right before our eyes. I quoted Jonathan Haidt earlier in, in another, and I had to cut out some because I messed up on the technology. In another quote from Jonathan Haidt, he says, he believes in the next 30 years, we may see a catastrophic failure of American democracy. And then he says, because we just don't know what the system will look like when you drain all trust out of it. Well, that, that looks like where we're headed right now, right? So if, if we're gonna play a role in preserving and defending the constitution, I, I hope it'll be with a deep knowledge of its history and tradition and its structure and how it works. But more important than that, I hope it will be that we can supply the bonds of affection that are absolutely indispensable for the constitution to succeed. That is a perfect place to conclude. Uh, Brother Griffith, thank you so much for sharing your words of wisdom tonight, for uh, bringing these uh, wonderful uh, historical and civic lessons and spiritual lessons to, to the dialogue fireside this evening. Uh, we'll conclude with a benediction from Erica Munson, again, just repeating, uh, visiting, uh, joining us from the Emmaus LGBTQ ministry. And uh, uh, we'll turn the time over to Sister Munson. Can you hear me, is my mic working? Yeah, okay. Our dear mother and father in heaven, we are so grateful to have gathered together as your little flock. We are grateful for the fellowship of each other. We're grateful for Brother Griffith. We're grateful for his service to our country 
and his willingness to share his thoughts and experience with us tonight. We're grateful for the founding principles of this country. And we ask thy forgiveness for our failure to live up to those founding principles. And we ask thy inspiration as we seek to improve and live up to them. Free us from the sin of pride, free us from selfishness, and motivate us to look again and again to Christ's teachings and to the example of building Zion in the Book of Mormon as a way to create a beloved community in our country. We ask a special blessing on our leaders at this time, on our citizenry. We ask for a peaceful transition of power during this election period. And we ask that each one of us will be able to look into the face of someone who troubles us and see the savior. Please bless us as we depart this evening. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.